Good evening, I am Randolph Barnwell, the Senior Elder of Gate Ministries, Durban Central. It is my privilege to welcome all of you who have joined us this evening in our exploration of what Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2 calls the foundation doctrines or elementary principles of Christ. There are six broadly categorized doctrines called foundation doctrines and these are Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, notice plural, not one baptism, the doctrine of baptisms, the laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgments. Tonight represents part seven in the series in which we are continuing our discussion on baptisms. In our last broadcast, we discussed water baptism and in tonight's broadcast and the next we're going to deal with baptism into the person and power of the Holy Spirit. Now what you're about to hear in terms of this specific teaching I recorded uh, about just under two years ago and I did not feel the need to re-record this because I felt there was a particular grace and anointing upon the release of that teaching. I want you to really open your hearts and to receive the teaching and to receive a fresh understanding, enlightenment and definitely impartation of the Holy Spirit and His power into your life. I pray that your experience in this baptism would be authentic, would be biblical, and that you will grow and move on towards perfection in Christ. So, great grace and peace to you as you listen to this teaching. My aim is to establish a very solid doctrinal basis of this particular facet of our belief. And for this purpose, I'm going to pour over tons of scripture to establish fervently and firmly in your mind the authenticity of this glorious experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. The reason also why I will take my time to painstakingly read scriptural references relative to the baptism in the Holy Ghost is to perhaps persuade some which because of your theological or traditional upbringing spiritually discount or think that this experience was only the norm and therefore relative to the experience of the church in the book of Acts, that is the early church, and some argue is not relevant for New Testament believers or sons of God today. I hope to by this presentation, appeal to you to open your heart and to look at the scriptures with a virgin mind. Look at the scriptures for what they say, not for what your tradition says. And may I sincerely encourage you. I believe that many of you who have not known this experience will experience a glorious baptism in the Holy Spirit. My aim also in 
painstakingly teaching this is to arm those of you who are baptized in the Spirit with a solid biblical basis for your experience and also in the hope that you would educate, train and teach others in the same. And for this purpose, my study notes will be made available to you. For those of you that are not part of Gate Ministries Durban Central, you can send an email request to info at gatedc.co.za to request the study notes. The study notes can also be downloaded from randolphbarnwell.com. Links to the website for the download will be specified in the comment section and in the description section here below. So let's get into it. Now, in the New Testament, there are six references where we have the phrase baptism and the phrase Holy Spirit with a reference to baptism in or with the Holy Spirit. While there are six references where these terms exist in the same verse of Scripture, the incidences are three, because six simply because they would be repeated in the Gospels. But let's read this. In reading the Scriptures too, I hope that your faith will be boosted, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God the Lord. The first instance is Matthew 3 and verse 11. John the Baptist speaking says, As for you, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Notice in the text the word baptize and with the Holy Spirit. Hence we get the term baptism with or in the Holy Spirit. Might I just say here before proceeding, the preposition with in the original Greek is the Greek word en, 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 which literally means in, the English I, in. So whenever you read in the New Testament the phrase, as is on your screen, for example, in this verse, baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It should be read correctly, baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So if you look at the next framing in Mark 1.8, again, John speaking, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with or in the Holy Spirit. In the next verse in Luke 3.18, John answered and said to them all, As for you, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with or in the Holy Spirit and fire. Again in John's Gospel, he records it as follows. John 1.33 I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one, that is Jesus, who baptizes with or in the Holy Spirit. Now, According to the Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John, their account of baptism in the Holy Spirit, all of them say that Jesus would do it. John said, I baptize you with water. There's one who is coming after me. That is Christ. That is Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I want you to factor this into your understanding. When we baptize people in water, a human being dips or immerses another human being into an element called water. The administration is by a human who represents God in this instance, 
baptizing, for example, a new convert or a new believer into water by total immersion and lifting them up again. When it comes to baptism in the Spirit, the person who dips or immerses you into the Holy Spirit is not another person. It's Jesus Christ himself. Because John said, he will baptize you. In all of the gospel accounts, there's a consistency here that Jesus Christ baptizes with the Holy Spirit. It is the responsibility of the Son of God himself to pour out his Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, upon humans that desire it to be so. So we read four accounts so far in the Gospels where you will see this term, baptism and Holy Spirit jointly put side by side. I, I told you there are six. So the other two references are Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now, the words of Jesus to his disciples. In Acts 11 and verse 16, And I remember the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Again, I want to emphasize, whenever you read in the Bible, baptism with the Holy Spirit should correctly be read baptism in the Holy Spirit. As you are baptized into water, so in reference to the Holy Spirit baptism, you are baptized into His person and you will experience a dynamic of His power. The next issue I want to bring to your attention is the number of recorded incidences in the Bible where people experience the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And there are five that I have found, five incidences where a person or groups of people experienced this wonderful baptism in the Holy Ghost. The first is obviously on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when the 120 disciples were in the upper room waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost fell on them and also fall them. The second incident is found in Acts chapter 8, where there was a revival in the city of Samaria at the hands of Philip the Evangelist. God used him mightily. Many believed. The apostles in Jerusalem heard about it, and they sent Peter and John down there. And when they came, laid hands on the new believers, and they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. The third incident is Saul of Tarsus, who would be renamed Paul the Apostle. Three days after his conversion, the Bible says he was filled with the Spirit, a term synonymous with being baptized in the Spirit. I will explain that in a moment. So we have the 120 on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. We have the Samaritan believers in Acts 8, 16. And then we have Saul of Tarsus in Acts 9, 17. And fourthly, we have Cornelius, who was the centurion officer. He and his entire household experienced baptism in the Holy Spirit. Fifthly, 12 disciples of John. John the Baptist had disciples that followed his teaching. Some of them would embrace the message of the cross and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Twelve of these were baptized with Paul administrating, overseeing this baptism in the Holy Spirit. So when you read through the book of Acts, you will see these accounts unfold to you. May I encourage you, may your record also be in this list. May you come to the place where you say, Randolph, I am to be counted amongst those who are baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So it's administrated by Jesus, the Son of God, Him, Himself. Now, what is actually meant by baptism in the Holy Spirit? The word baptize is the Greek word baptizo. Bapto is the root word, which literally means to dip. So baptizo, from which we get the English baptize or baptism, literally means to immerse into, where the person's entire being is immersed. That is why in the case of water baptisms, we hold to the doctrine that a person's entire body should be immersed into the element of water. Now, similarly, in the Holy Spirit's baptism, the entire personality, the entire being of the believer or the Son of God is immersed into the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. In all the accounts in which you will either read directly or indirectly on baptism in the Spirit, particularly in the book of Acts, you always read of Him coming from, that is the Holy Spirit, Him coming from out the believer or outside of the believer and coming over or upon Him and also filling Him simultaneously within. I want to say that it's very important. The Holy Spirit will come into your venue and come around you and over you and envelop you. In that sense, your being is immersed into His person and His power. And also, He will fill you within. Now, let's look at the scriptural evidence for this. In the book of Acts, in the first recorded account, the first time the Holy Spirit was poured out in a huge way, deluge of his power poured out upon 120 disciples who were in one accord praying in an upper room waiting for this first occurrence of the Holy Spirit's outpouring on the earth. This has never happened in this fashion throughout human history. Before this, even in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come almost sporadically upon people for a season for them to accomplish a very specific task. For example, the Spirit, the Bible says, came upon Samson when the Philistines attacked him. Okay, And so it would come, but now never come to settle, never come to abide. And I will explain later why this is so, because Jesus had not paid the price for the sin of mankind on the cross. So the Holy Spirit could only be given in fullness after Calvary. So the first time that this would happen in human history is recorded in the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 would be a passage I would like to look at in a bit more finer detail in a few broadcasts to come. But let's read one particular reference. This is how that experience is described in verse 17 of Acts 2. It shall come or it shall be in the last days, God says, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So it says, look at the, the text that is bolded on your screen, that I will pour forth. Say it with me, pour forth. Come on, say it again. Say, pour forth my spirit. So you have the idea of God, specifically, we know it would be Jesus himself in this instance, literally offloading, pouring forth the spirit upon humankind. Again in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, Therefore, being exalted, this is talking about Jesus, therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has, that is Jesus, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. And then in Acts 8 and verse 16, For He had not fallen upon any of them and they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus note the words again fallen on so he comes from without and he comes upon a person or a people 
In Acts 10, 45, all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles only. Again, note the words poured out. Acts 10, 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them all who were listening to the message. Acts eleven fifteen, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as He did upon us at the beginning. This is Peter's record of what happened in the home of Cornelius. Peter went to preach. As he was preaching, the Holy Spirit interrupted his message, simply fell on them, and they spoke with tongues. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. In Acts 19 and verse 6, when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Okay, came upon them, and they began to speak uh, with tongues and prophesying. Now, if you examine the account in Acts 2 a bit more closely, before the Holy Spirit came or filled them, the Holy Spirit came into the room and filled the house where they were. Acts 2 verse 2 says that while they were praying, waiting, suddenly there came, a, there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. So they heard this sound like a violent rushing wind, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And it filled the house where they were sitting. So picture 120 people in absolute oneness. The Bible says they were in one accord, no division, no disunity. That's a very important um, activating factor. To invite the Holy Spirit within your context. No disunity. There must be absolute oneness. And the Bible says it came like the sound of a violent rushing wind and filled the house. Then two verses down, Acts 2, 4. And, everyone say and, just and, besides us, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. It would seem from analyzing these accounts that the baptism in the Holy Spirit includes two primary things. Number one, He will come from without over you and envelop your being, envelop your person, your personality. You will feel His presence saturate your physical body, your soul and your spirit, I believe. And then the second uh, factor is, besides coming from without and enveloping you from without, covering you, totally encasing you, also too He will fill you, because that is what it says here in Acts 2 and verse 4. It says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So these two things must of necessity take place. You will see this, for example, after Paul gave his heart to the Lord Jesus, was converted from Judaism and uh, was blinded for three days. God sent a gentleman by the name of Ananias to his house to pray for the recovery of his sight and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's read it. Acts 9 verse 17. So Ananias departed, entered the house, after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Spirit. I believe the account here in Acts 9 describes Paul's baptism in the Holy Spirit. Paul here, three days after his conversion, was filled with the Spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 2, the disciples 
were enveloped by the Spirit's power from without, and they were filled with the Spirit and began speaking in tongues. So here is my succinct definition of what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is. You will see it on your screen. And this conclusion is born out out of an investigation into all of these principles containing these scriptures. The baptism in the Holy Spirit takes place when the believer's entire being is completely immersed in the person and the power of the Holy Spirit who is poured out from above coming over him or her entirely enveloping the person with his power and presence from outside and and also filling him to overflowing within you can expect to experience two things he the holy spirit come upon you and he the holy spirit filling you okay filling you to overflowing it's a wonderful wonderful glorious absolutely essential experience for all sons of god to enter into i might just want to remind you here that don't think of the holy spirit first in terms of power think of him first in terms of the fact that he is a person our view of the holy spirit needs adjustment because the average believer's view of the spirit is his god's power to be used when the moment calls for it he is not given the proper accord and esteem in our lives may i remind you he is not a force he is a person together with the father the son the holy spirit is very much god the father the son and the holy spirit are equal they are consubstantial the substance which is grace that is in the father is in the son and is in the holy spirit he is often called the neglected part of the trinity because many of us can readily easily relate to jesus because jesus saved us he's our savior he forgives our sins he paid the price on the cross and then too many would then easily relate to god the father is our papa our daddy our father we art in heaven we normally pray but many people feel like our primary associations of relationship should be should be directed towards father and son to the neglect of the holy spirit in later broadcasts i will actually demonstrate that you will never adequately relate to father and son as you should without the specific aid of the holy spirit because it's the holy spirit who is the executor of god's kingdom one of his functions is to make known the father to you one of his functions is to make known the son to you so without him you cannot know the fullness of the godhead now let me just stop here while i've reminded you that he is a person not essentially a power nevertheless when you are baptized into his personhood into the person of the holy spirit you must think uh, who is coming over me who's going to fill me to overflowing it's not an abstract force it's actually a person it's a person with power and no doubt you will sense uh, a degree of power so to speak by the way you don't need to be dramatic about this uh, you don't need to have goosebumps or anything this is received by faith and i will explain that to you in next week's broadcast you can very simply be baptized in the spirit and trust god for the one of the outcomes is to speak with other tongues and to prophesy which i will explain next week as well for now i'm simply desiring to whet your appetite to create desire within you 
So what are the conditions for this baptism? Who can be baptized in the Spirit? The basic requirements are very, very simple. You need to be a son of God. If you are God's son, you are eligible to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. How do you become a son of God? You become a son of God by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. It's a simple matter of opening your hearts, symbolically so, and surrendering your entire life to His Lordship. Allow Him to lead, direct, and govern your life. Serve Him. He will, as you confess your sins to Him, He will forgive you of any sin, cleanse your heart, and put a new heart and spirit within you, making you His Son. You'll become a Son of God. The basic requirements for you who are listening to me. Some of you might not be saved. All it takes is a surrender to God. Open your heart and say, uh, Father, Lord Jesus, I am sorry for the life I have lived apart from you, disconnected from you. You can say prayers like, I realize my need for you. Forgive me for the breach of disconnecting from you, living my own uh, life independent of you. Confess your sin to him and the Bible says he will forgive you of your sin. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Just believe. Believe that Jesus is God's son, that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved in his name. And even as I, I speak to you this morning, there might be some that don't know the Lord. I speak to you by the authority of God. And I say to you, repent, turn from your ways and surrender your heart to the Lord. God loves you in ways that will absolutely amaze you. And he wants to give you his Holy Spirit, but he wants your heart first. So as you believe, repent from your sin, believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe you will find entrance into God's kingdom. John 1, 12 says, as many as received Jesus... He gave the power to be called the Son of God. And you can come into the kingdom. And if that is you, I pray for you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive Christ. Lift your hands where you are. Invite the Lord into your heart. Invite Him into your life. Confess your sins. Surrender your life to the Lord. And come into the kingdom. If that is you and you're praying prayers as you're listening to me. And your heart is open, I say to you, your sins are forgiven you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now come in to the kingdom. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Now that you are part of this kingdom, I will encourage you find a Bible-based church. Find a true family of God that you can be a part of, where you can grow um, in your relationship with God, your Father. So I want to read now some scriptures that clearly indicate, or just reference, I won't read them, just reference some accounts that clearly indicate to us that the necessary preconditions for baptism in the Holy Spirit is to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to believe in Him or to repent and turn from your sins. In the book of Acts chapter 9 and also Acts 22 verse 8 to 10, you will see in Acts 9 the description of Paul's conversion. And in verse 22 before the Sanhedrin, Paul would give a description of these events. And Paul gave his heart to the Lord as it were, was introduced to Jesus sovereignly. Right? Three days later he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. So belief in Christ, relationship with Christ was prerequisite to his baptism in the Holy Spirit experience. In the book of Acts chapter 8 verse 12, Philip the evangelist uh, preached the word in Samaria and many people in Samaria believed, multitudes of them, many believed the apostles who were still at Jerusalem heard about a revival in Samaria. And they sent, I think it was Peter and John, down there. And the Bible says when they came, you'll read in the book of Acts, 
8, 16 and 17, they lay their hands upon these new believers and these new believers were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then in the book of Acts chapter 19, you'll read the account of how Paul the Apostle met 12 disciples of John who had believed and accepted Christ, surrendered their lives to Christ, but had not at that stage experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I will encourage you, perhaps take the time to read Acts 19, because these guys didn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit. They believed in Jesus. They were totally unaware, totally oblivious to the fact that there is a person in the Godhead called the Holy Spirit. And Paul asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? This is Acts 19 and verse 5. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? So you must believe to receive the Holy Spirit. Believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior to receive the baptism in the precious Holy Spirit. And then another case is in Acts chapter 10. Here, Peter comes to a Roman officer's house, a Roman centurion in the person of Cornelius, preaches the gospel to them while preaching about Christ. The Holy Spirit came upon them. Now, many people cite this verse and they say, yes, in accounts that I don't need to believe to be baptized in the Spirit because the Holy Spirit came upon them while Peter was preaching. And there's no record that they first believed or first repented, but the Spirit fell. Now that's if you only read Acts chapter 10. After this account, they were baptized in water, the whole household of Cornelius was. Then Peter went back to give a report to the other apostles. And this in the next chapter in Acts 11 is what Peter said to them in verse 15. Peter's explaining what happened in the household of Cornelius. And he says the following, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he did upon us at the beginning. In other words, in Acts 2. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized you with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us. Also, after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? I just love the statement of Peter. So he says he, the, the Lord gave these Gentile Romans the same gift as those 120 Jews in the upper room, gave the same gift of the Holy Spirit to them. And when they heard this, they quieted down, glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also repentance that leads to life. So obviously, yeah, look at verse 17. Peter said, We believed and the Holy Spirit fell on us. And he implies they too believed and the Holy Spirit fell on them. So while there's no record of it, it's implied that while Peter was preaching, that in their hearts already, that the people were believing and repenting as Peter preached. And it was the ideal venue, conditions, grounds for the Holy Spirit to fall on the people. So you must believe. Everyone say believe. Everyone say repent. Say believe in the Lord Jesus. These are preconditions to receive this baptism. I just want to add something here. You are baptized in water once. You are baptized in suffering many times. And later on I will teach the baptism in suffering. You are also baptized in the Holy Spirit, not a, as a once-off experience. This can happen recurrently. And should happen perpetually. Yes, there's always a first time for it. But never ever say, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit in the year 1950. What must happen is, there's an, an initial baptism in the Spirit. But you must maintain this by constant fillings and refillings. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, it says, being filled with the Spirit. 
speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Be not drunk with wine wherein is in excess, but be full. That word be filled there with the Spirit in the Greek tense is present continuous tense. Now, I want to encourage all, you might be serving God for many years, uh, and you might have hit a dry patch, so to speak. There might have been some leakage, as it were, because of your non-compliance or disobedience to God's ways. I want to remind you here that the Holy Spirit is extremely sensitive. He is a person with feelings. And the Bible constantly warns us not to grieve Him and not to quench Him. Also not to sin against Him. Many times He lifts or there's not that degree of power and anointing as you've known before. One verse that helps me to maintain perpetual flow and anointing of the Spirit's power and presence in my life is Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. It says the following, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey Him. God has given to them that obey Him. I will encourage all of you to memorize Acts 5.32, at least even the phrase, God has given the Holy Spirit to all them that obey Him. Um, those of us who are saved and have repented of our sin and we're growing in Christ, what the Holy Spirit looks for in you is obedience. And wherever there's obedience, you will find the Holy Spirit. Wherever there's disobedience, you will find a dissipating of His power and effect within your life. That's a whole session on its own. This is not the focus of today's session. So let me get back to the emphasis here. So from examining the scriptures, there's very clear evidence that salvation, that is believing in Christ by repenting from your sin, confessing your sin, surrendering your heart to Jesus as Lord and as Savior, that that salvation or initial salvation experience is something completely separate to baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to read some verses to prove this. While we've already read accounts of first believe, then receive the baptism in the Spirit, here is some more evidence. In the book of John chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay, Jesus here yeah, to Nicodemus said, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. That's John 3, 3. But yeah, in 3, 5, he describes what being born again is. He says, you must be born of the Spirit and born of water. Born of water literally means being born again by the Word of God. Peter would say we are born again by the incorruptible seed, the Word of God that lives and abides forever. So the phrase born of water means being born of the Word of God. Because when you hear God's Word, the Bible calls God's Word a seed. Now seeds give birth to things. As you receive God's Word in you, something grows of the nature of God to displace your carnal nature and to grow the nature of God within your being. But Jesus also said, not just being born of water by the Word, you must be born also of the Spirit. So, when you surrender your heart to the Lord, you become born again by the Spirit of God. At the salvation experience, the Spirit of God is already active within your life in the new birth. Okay, In Ezekiel 36, 27, it says, God says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances note here god says i will put my spirit in you right put my spirit in you when you surrender your life to him at the new birth or salvation experience when we say yes to Christ and we start to serve Him, make a decision for God, what happens is, by the Word of God, your nature, the nature of your spirit starts to change. You are spirit, soul, and body. The Holy Spirit comes in 
to start a work of renovation of your inward spirit man. He, the Holy Spirit, actually takes up residence there within you. It's a marvelous thing that the eternal God, the Spirit of God, comes to reside within me, to regenerate my spirit. Then you have the power or the capacity to relate to God as Father by the Spirit within you. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 5 and 7, it says the following, So that He might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but you are a son, and if a son, then an heir with God. So at your salvation experience, He, the Holy Spirit, takes up residence in your spirit, in your heart, renovates, renews you. He gives you the authority and ability in you to cry, Abba, Father. In fact, He cries in and through your spirit to relate to you your God as your Father. The Spirit of the Son is sent into you to relate to God as Father. That's the salvation experience. All these verses do not refer to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. These are verses that relate to the Spirit's work in you at the point of salvation. Now I want to demonstrate in the life of the disciples these two separate experiences. Jesus died, was dead for three days. On the third day, he rose from the dead. And then he was seen for at least 40 days um, in and about Jerusalem. And then he would be taken up into heaven, right? And he would ascend. So you have his life, you have his death, you have his burial, you have his resurrection, and then his ascension back to his father in heaven when he rose from the dead he appeared to his disciples and you'll find this in the book of john 20. he came into a room walking through the walls where they were and he quieted down and said fear not peace be with you and this is what he said to them verse 22 of john 20. when he had said this he breathed on them and he said to them receive the holy spirit so this is immediately after his resurrection comes into a room to his 12 receive the holy spirit the bible says he breathed on them <sighs> receive the holy spirit right this is not the baptism in the holy spirit the word receive here is the greek word lambano which describes an act that takes place simultaneously as the thing is spoken an act that takes place simultaneously as the thing is spoken so when jesus said ah, receive the holy spirit the holy spirit took up residence in each disciple immediately they did not have him before this in this fashion this is after the resurrection right so the indwelling spirit is now resident within all of these 12. To the same 12 later, Jesus would say, this is found in the book of Luke 24, 49. Behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city, that's Jerusalem, until you are clothed with power from on high. So to the same group, he says two different things. <sighs> Receive the Holy Spirit. Then he says, go wait in the city until you are clothed clothed put on power from on high the spirit that i've just breathed into you takes up residence in you because i've just paid the price on my cross for the sins of humanity so that the spirit can now reside permanently in men by virtue of their belief in me crying out abba father now you can all relate to my god as your father not just my father but our father who art in heaven to the same group he says go wait for 10 days in jerusalem until he comes a 
upon you. The same spirit in you now wants to come upon you and not just be in you, but fill you to overflowing. To the same group, Jesus said, before he was taken up and ascended in a cloud back to his Father in heaven, Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So there's a difference in, in John 20, him saying, he breathed on them saying, receive the Holy Spirit, and then saying, go wait until he comes upon you. All of you who are God's sons, have the Holy Spirit resident within your spirit. But it does not mean that you are baptized in His power. These are two separate experiences that all sons of God are meant to come into. Okay, The Bible says that um, as a sort of symbolic indicator of this, in the book of John chapter 4, Jesus said the following to the woman at the well. John 4, 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Jesus here talks to a Samaritan woman at the well. And they're talking on the matter of thirst and water. So Jesus says to her, whoever drinks of the water I give him will never thirst. But the water I give him, I give to him, will be in him a well springing up to eternal life. So Jesus referenced, I believe, by the way, water is symbolic of the word and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says the Holy Spirit is like a well in you. Notice the phrase, in him a well springing up to eternal everlasting life that relates to your salvation experience because just three chapters later in john 7 verse 37 jesus says something completely different and he says the following now on the last day that great day of the feast jesus stood and cried saying if anyone is thirsty this is a different thirst now let him come to me and drink he who believes in me as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke of the spirit whom those who would believe in him were to receive. For the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now watch the explanation. In John 4, Jesus said to quench your thirst, drink of the water that he gives. It'll be in you a well and the result will be eternal life a well springing up to eternal life so the indwelling well which is the spirit relates to eternal life you are saved you receive christ you have life everlasting and eternal life is your promise but in john 7 jesus said now if you are thirsty come to me in the first place in john 4 you simply had to believe okay and, 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 and believe in him, he'll give you this water in your well. But now you must come and you must thirst more. And now he says, the water will be in you like rivers of living water. Okay? It says, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. He will believe in me as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of water. In John 4, it's in you a well. In John 7, it's rivers of water in you. And the Bible says they overflow out from your innermost being. In other words, they will flow out of you. The first one establishes who you are. In you a well. You are saved. You are God's son. The second experience, the Holy Spirit's baptism. The Holy Spirit will definitely come upon you from without in case you're being, fill you from within and flow through you. And later on, I will discuss some of the outworkings, the results of this baptism. It is meant to benefit you, but also meant to make you a witness, credible witness for God in this world. In the book of the Old Testament, rather, in that era where God led his people out of Egyptian bondage, particularly as recorded in the book of Exodus, 
they would often thirst. God told Moses one time, strike a rock. And Moses struck the rock and water flowed and their thirst was quenched. So the rock had to be struck for water to flow. That rock symbolically was Jesus Christ himself, which according to the apostle Paul, by revelation, that rock actually followed them in the wilderness. For example, in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul says the following, They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. They drank spiritual drink, spiritual water from a spiritual rock. Paul was very clear, that rock, that rock followed them, that rock was Christ. The rock was struck by Moses so that the water could flow. Jesus on the cross was struck, crucified for the sins of humanity. So that a few days later, the Holy Spirit's water could be poured out upon all of humanity. Now my time is fast going, but I want to just encourage you. I really want to encourage you. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is an absolutely essential and very necessary experience for you and your children. Jesus paid the price for it before the cross. That is why before Calvary, the Holy Spirit could not be poured out as He was on the day of Pentecost onward, even up to this present day. Might I prophesy to this house under my leadership, Gate Ministries Durban Central, I foresee and perceive such a, a deluge of God's power being poured out afresh upon us. And I want to encourage you, even if you are baptized in the Spirit, remember this is not a once-off experience. This happens recurrently. And we're going to have the faith to believe and trust God for it. Now, I'm going to pray for you in a moment. But also, too, I want to welcome all of you to a Zoom meeting on Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. I want you to be in the spirit of prayer. Fast if you can. Although you don't need to do these things. All you need to do is have the, rest, the requisite faith. Just believe. And be desirous. I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. To the members of our house, I will encourage you to speak to all of your youth and all of your children to be present. We're going to pray that God fills us with His Holy Spirit. For the next three weeks, we're going to do this. And we will do it as in the future as the Lord would lead us. But I just feel that many of us are doing a lot of things not in the power of the Spirit. And He's there to help you. He's there as your guide, your comforter, your advocate, your paracletos. And His power is available. His guidance is there. And you'll find your, your entrance into the gifts of the Spirit, your power to be an effective witness for God, which I'll explain in later broadcasts, grow and accentuate to the next level in God. I want you to be this way minded. For the next few days, think Holy Spirit. Worship Him. Thank God for Him. Be very sensitive to Him. Because I believe, I'm trusting God that He comes upon my home, all of my children and my grandchild. John the Baptist, while being an unborn baby, the Bible says, was filled with the Spirit. So don't tell me that children are not part of this experience. In fact, Acts 2 clearly says this promise is for you and your sons and your daughters to as many as even are afar off in the name of Jesus. So I want to encourage you here with this. Meet us on Tuesday evening in this descriptor. The link will be posted. So you're more than welcome to, to join us there. Why wait for that? If you are ready now, lift up your hands. I'm going to pray. I will pray and you just be in a mode of reception and receive it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, you see your sons that are ready and poised to experience a new level of your spirit's power in their lives because they love you they obey you they have 
believed in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they have repented from their sins, turned away from their wicked ways, and are serving you, God. Now, Father, this is your promise, and you have delegated this function to your eternal Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus, I ask you, in your great name, pour out your Spirit upon your sons and your daughters in the name of Jesus Christ. Pour it forth. Let your Spirit fall upon us now. By faith we receive it, this power, this personage of the Spirit, both enveloping our being and welling up inside us, filling us to overflowing. I receive personally, by faith, a new level of your baptism, your enveloping and your infilling now in the precious name of Jesus. And I stretch my hands to those who are viewing right now. And I say to you, receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And as the Lord gives you utterance, you can start to speak in other tongues, in a new language. By faith, just open your mouth and speak as the Lord will give you utterance now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that this is happening now. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are surrounding many, covering many, enveloping many in their homes, over them, around them, filling them to overflowing inwardly. You said, if we thirst and we do thirst, we come thirsty, we come desirous, we come hungry. Fill us, fill your people now in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. If you believe you have received, be it unto you according to your faith. This promise of the Father must be received by faith according to the book of Galatians. And I want to encourage you to start, God, to start to trust God for an utterance, which I'll explain next week exactly where does the speaking in tongues fit into this baptism. But maintain this. Be conscious of it. Your prayer life is going to go to the next level as you do. God will be with you. Well, I trust that you were enriched, enlightened, and encouraged by the doctrine of the baptism into the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. Please remember this baptism is one of those continuous baptism. Paul would say in Ephesians 5, be filled with the Spirit, which in the original Greek tense simply means be consistently or continually filled in the power of the precious Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would be enriched in your walk with Christ. Remember, He is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's very, very much God. He's not a, an abstract force or extraneous power, but He's a person. He is God Himself. And I pray that your walk in relationship with Him will be further enhanced and greatly enriched as you desire consistent infillings, baptisms, and rebaptisms of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to present to you in our next broadcast five distinct biblical keys that will make your entrance into this experience easy and inevitable. We will release this on Sunday evening. I want to greatly encourage you here to really prepare for Sunday evening, to be in a spirit of prayer, fast if you can on the weekend, um, as your schedule allows you to. I would also want to encourage you to share this information with anybody else that you think might benefit from this doctrine and its information. I'm trusting God that many of us have an infilling and a re-infilling of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I just ask you to be generous in your sharing uh, because you're going to be helping somebody as you do this. Great grace and abundant peace be yours in Christ. See you next time. Bye-bye.
faithful Lord. 